Well, sounds like we are being uh, recorded, which means we can start our conversation. Uh, I am Rabbi Dennis Sasso, and I would like to welcome you all uh, to our uh, conversation on uh, what we have called uh, for this year's series, Rejuvenation. And um, this is an opportunity for some to be introduced to Judaism, for others to refresh, to uh, to re, uh, to renew, to uh, to review their um, learning and uh, deepen their understanding. Uh, this is a very um, free floating seminar. The fact that we are on Zoom um, helps in certain ways, and uh, then. Uh, makes things a little bit more uh, complicated in other ways. But I want you all to feel free to um, raise your hand or simply to express an opinion if you feel that it is time to do so as I am talking. Uh, I have a list of many of you who had expressed interest in participating in this class. Others may be just joining uh, as we uh, move along uh, in the program, either on this for this session or for sessions that will follow. Uh, for some of you, as I said earlier, this is uh, something that you are doing because of an interest that you may have in exploring uh, Judaism uh, as a personal choice. Uh, but uh, neither your participating in this series um, nor my uh, nor my teaching it is a commitment uh, on your part or on our part to, um, to conclude that process. Uh, this series is a uh, introductory uh, opportunity to explore that further. And then uh, for those of you who are interested in the possibility of uh, becoming Jewish, uh, then uh, that conversation will continue. The um, First thing that I'd like to do is to remind you that this series will work best for those of you who will visit our website and listen to the programs that were taped last year on the same topics as this series. I see that there are some people uh, who took this uh, course last year with me. I, I'd like to welcome you, but uh, bear in mind that this in many ways will be a uh, second look at many of the things that we talked about last year. And there is always something new uh, to be added, something new to be uh, learned, even an opinion to be changed. You know, I once uh, approached my mentor, Rabbi Mordecai Kaplan, the founder of the Reconstructionist Movement, perhaps the most prominent 20th century American Jew. And I said to him, Dr. Kaplan, what you said last week in class is contradicted by what you said this week in class. And then he looked at me and he smiled. I was a little bit nervous about making that comment, but he looked at me and smiled and says, you're right, I also am evolving. Uh, because his definition of Judaism, of course, is the evolving religious civilization of the Jewish people. So we are entitled to evolve. We, uh, uh, that's what life is all about, an ongoing dynamic, uh, both uh, physical and intellectual and, and moral and social. So welcome to Rejuvenation. Uh, I'd like to just do some very brief introductions so that we know who is here and why you are here. Um, I would ask you in, the, in, in a half a minute to tell us your name, uh, where you live. We might have some people joining from uh, other towns, cities. Uh, or even beyond, and what brings you to this conversation? Uh, so uh, I have names here, but I don't see everybody's name uh, on screen. So Jackie, could you help us uh, with moving through the process? Uh, the first person on my screen, top left, is CB. Who is CB? There she is, she's smiling. You wanna introduce yourself? Yeah, uh, my name is Caroline. Um, I'm 29. I live in Indianapolis. Um, I'm here because I'm interested in converting and I followed along last year. Um, I missed, um, I kind of caught the train a little bit late to actually 
go on for the course, but I followed along with the videos. And so I'm uh, really excited to be able to be in the course this time. Nice to have you. Uh, there is a consideration, and Jackie and I will talk about this as the course unfolds and if circumstances permit, to, um, uh, to invite you to uh, a couple of sessions in person here at the Synodon. That way we might have an opportunity to do a little bit of touring, exploring the facility, looking at some of the uh, um, um, symbols uh, of Judaism, more of a, of a hands-on uh, experience. But um, let's see how things go, and uh, we can explore that as we move along. Um, do you want to handle this, Jackie? Uh, I don't know how your screen looks or what, uh, what's the best way to do this. Jackie may have stepped out, in which case I will pick up and ask Jim Roth, who is taking, I think, this course for the third time at least, right? Jim, you can teach it next year. Give us a, a quick intro and... Uh, uh, Hi, my name is James Roth. I'm a relatively new converted Jew. Uh, I have, I was about 72, I think, when I did it. So I've got to hurry up and uh, learn as much as I can from Rabbi Dennis and uh, from reading the Torah and the Talmud and everything I can. So that's what it's all about for me. Thank you. Welcome back, Jim. Uh, so last, the first time was a BA, then last year you got your MA, you're working on the PhD now, right? Yes, sir. Okay, looking forward to that. Um, and Martine, you also uh, sat with us last year. We can't hear you. Correct, Rabbi, I did. So my name is Martine, I am a born Jewish. Um, now I have better time and more time to connect with the community in Indianapolis, of Indianapolis. And I am uh, very interested in uh, looking at my faith uh, with different point of views, which connect to it what I, my thought would be as what it is to be Jewish and to be belonging to a community. Wonderful. Nice to have you back. Thank and, you. Uh, next to you, I see Jim Hammonds. Yeah, hi, I'm uh, Jim. I um, live in Muncie, um, and um, I've been uh, th uh, learning about Judaism for about a year now, and uh, very interested in, in completing the conversion process. I kind of, I've, I've taken some other classes, and I kind of think of this class as, you know, that sort of last checkpoint before, uh, before I make the decision to go forward, so. Wonderful. But, Mm -hmm. uh, if you wish to tell us what you do when you introduce yourselves, that might help us get a little uh, rounder picture. So, okay, um, yeah, I do. Um, I, I work in in the library at Ball State University. Right. Mm -hmm. well, welcome, uh, Catherine. Hi, I'm Catherine. Um, I live in downtown Indianapolis. I'm a paralegal. Um, and I've been interested in converting to Judaism for a lot of years now. <laughs> um, so I'm really ready to start taking those next steps and making it happen. So I have been looking at different synagogues in the Indianapolis area and have taken um, a class from a few of them, but I'm looking for the one that I feel like I really fit into. So I'm very excited for this course and I've heard wonderful things about um, the Sasso. So I can't wait to get to know um, Rabbi Sasso more uh, and as all of you as well. It's nice to have some community time. Wonderful, welcome. And you live in downtown Indianapolis, you said? Yeah. Okay, so you're within commuting commuting distance. Uh, Pablo, you uh, escaped for a few moments. You want to tell us very briefly? We can't, you are, there you go. Yes, my name is Pablo Slobodnik. Well, I guess I'm not new because I was there, I think about a year ago before COVID-19 in person, a couple of times. So I just trying, I guess, I don't know how to explain. Um, that's okay, that's good. See if there's anything new going on or 
Well, if I, yes, I remember, I'm sorry. Yes. No, I'm saying I'm just here to listen and participate in, I already, I'm already Jewish. So I know, I know a lot of the stuff already, but I would like to know, you know, sometimes different perspective and I guess, I don't know. I don't know too much what to say. I mean, I've been there a couple of times. But if so. I say bienvenido, Pablo. Gracias. Uh, pa Pablo uh, grew up in Argentina and uh, he lives in Indianapolis. Nice to have you with us again. Uh, Todd Katz, member of our board. Nice to welcome you. Good morning. I, um, I grew up in uh, Northern Indiana. I've been in Indianapolis my entire adult life and been a member of Bethel. I've been on the board for about 14 years. So I look forward to meeting many of you. And uh, I'm in the medical manufacturing business. Um, I look forward to this class just for ongoing continuous education. And uh, usually every class Rabbi puts on, you, we all get benefit from. So I'm gonna enjoy this one too. Thank you, Doug. Nice to have you on board. And as I walk down the screen, I see uh, Hunter. Hello, uh, my name's Hunter. I am a anthropology major at Ball State University in Muncie. And I am interested in this course because I wish to convert to Judaism. I have been studying it on my own for about two or three years, and now I'm excited to be taking courses. Great. Uh, what area of anthropology do you focus on, Hunter, if I may add? Uh, it's archaeological currently. Oh, good. Well, we're going to do, do a little bit of a biblical uh, uh, archaeology and history as we talk, uh, perhaps even today. So you might be able to help us there. Welcome. Uh, and then uh, C. Wade is uh, a screen that I see. Hi, my name is Courtney. Um, I have been studying um, Judaism for, for many years now and would like to continue with the conversion process. My fiance is Jewish and um, that is kind of a goal we've had for quite a long time. Um, I am a wine and fine spirits rep um, in Lafayette, Indiana. Um, and I even did a minor in Judaism studies at Purdue University for a while, but given that was like 10 years ago. <laughs> Wonderful. Nice, nice to have you with us. And I'm sure that you will bring some spirits to our conversation. <laughs> yes, I can do that. Okay. Um, Hunter? Did we... Is there a second one? Is there, oh, no. there's I'm anyone sorry. else who yeah, has Kat, you, you showed up twice in, in different spots in my screen. So if there's wanna, anyone else who would like to introduce themselves, feel free. I think I have Emily and Evelyn. Uh, yeah, I can go. Uh, my name is Emily. My camera is in use by somebody else. So next week I should have it. Um, I grew up just down the street from Bethel um, and I live in Noblesville now. So all of my friends growing up and neighbors were all Jewish and attended Bethel. And now I've 20 years later, 30 years later, found myself engaged to a Jew. And so now I'm kind of like fate coming back to it, to the place where I grew up at, even though I was raised Christian, but going back there to the temple that I always heard about growing up. So I'm looking to convert. Very good. Well, I'd like to welcome all of you and some of you have introduced yourselves personally and some by chat. Uh, we have a diverse group, and uh, I look forward to our uh, ongoing uh, conversation and exchange. Um, I indicated earlier that the best way to, I think, to, cook, to connect with this course is by looking at last year's uh, video. That way we have a basis for the conversation that we can have today. So, let me begin by asking the same question with which I started last year's series. Some of you have been born Jewish and raised Jewish. Some of you have uh, uh, explored Judaism. Some of you are connected with people who are Jewish. Um, there are different paths that bring you to this conversation. If you had to give me um, 
a, a brief single sentence or two description of what Judaism is or what being Jewish means to you, um, would you care to do that? And you can do that either orally or if you would prefer to put it on the chat, we can, we can have those entries as well. Anybody? I can go. Uh, for me, in my experience with it, with my fiance and the kids I grew up, it's all about family and tradition and all about family. Thank you, Emily. So the centrality of family and tradition. When you say family, um, that's an interesting term that can mean your own nuclear family, or are we talking about a broader sense of being part of a larger extended family? Well, for me, I would say starting with the immediate family, like my in-laws, but then, I mean, even everyone here and everyone in the temple as a whole is another whole big family to join. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, so we have the concept of tradition, the concept of, uh, of family. Any other uh, thoughts? Nothing is wrong. Every opinion is valid here. We're not uh, writing the textbook. We are, we are kind of pulling out the threads. Um, just to add a couple of thoughts, I think um, as I started learning about Judaism, um, I think three things impressed me. First of all, the I, I guess the, the, the community aspect, the strength of the community feeling among Jews. Um, and along with that, um, I think sort of a pervasive commitment to to justice, social justice in particular, that 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 I saw a lot of, and um, but also the fact that it was rooted in you know sort of ancient ancient wisdom that is also evolving. Um, that was the big surprise when I started actually attending a shul um, on over Zoom. How how much it's I, uh, you know, the conversation continues and the, the change is just sort of ongoing and continuous. So, and that it, that is, um, the, the shul I attend is a reconstructionist shul. So there's a lot of, <laughs> a lot of evolution. <laughs> so, May I ask where that is, uh, Jim, that you uh, connect with the synagogue? Yeah, it's a uh, West End synagogue in New oh. York City. Rabbi Emily Cohen is the oh. spiritual leader, yeah. Well, a little bit of uh, history, West End Synagogue in New York emerged from the Manhattan Reconstructionist Havura, which was a group that began as a kind of a group that separated from the Society for the Advancement of Judaism, oh, wow. which was the original sure. Reconstructionist congregation founded by Mordecai Kaplan. Yeah. 1922. Uh, so in 1974, a group of like-minded people uh, emerged and they started the Manhattan Reconstructionist Havura. The Manhattan Reconstructionist Havura became the West End Synagogue. The first rabbi of the Manhattan Reconstructionist Havura was Rabbi Sandy Eisenberg Sasso. My wow. Wife. <laughs> so she was the founding rabbi of what would become the West End Synagogue, although in during the three years that she served it while we lived in New York before coming to Indianapolis from 74 to 77, uh, it was known as the Manhattan Reconstructionist Havura. And uh, I was the rabbi of the Reconstructionist Synagogue of the North Shore in Great Neck, Roslyn. And then in 77, we came to Indianapolis. So you see, there is, there yeah. is history uh in the making that's amazing <laughs> thank Wonderful. you for sharing well, say hi to say hi to emily when you uh connect with them for me she's a very talented uh young rabbi yeah okay any uh, this is a wonderful um any other thoughts um again snippets like that we're not writing the textbook we're just sharing thoughts um yes. one thing I've, I've um kind of found really cool is um I've read a lot about being a light in the world and about, um, you know, like when you're actively Jewish, part of that is um, like 
humanity and being like personable to people and like there's so many laws that like govern how you are supposed to act towards each other and you know even if somebody else isn't Jewish they're still like receiving the benefit of those principles and those morals so I always thought that was really beautiful and cool. Yes, I like that you refer to them as, as principles because I'll, I'll come back to that. Hmm. Any other thoughts? Um, to kind of add to Emily's thought of um, tradition, there's a tradition in the history um, that we always go back to and read about and discuss, but the, the continuing of learning and looking at the past and learning from it is something that stands out to me. Hmm. Thank you. Mm. One more, Pablo? Well, I don't know how to use the word. It's not a tradition. I guess it's more like, can they say heritage? Heritage? Mm -hmm. That a person is born Jewish, so he has his ancestors Jewish, and it's like a chain. I don't know how to explain it in other words. I don't know if it's some values in, in well, I won't say, I can use it as family, but if somebody, it was born into it, you know, it's like, a, I don't know how to explain it. I mean, I don't know. I, don't know. I think you have explained it well. I okay. think what you're saying is that there is a sense of, of, of historic uh, continuity and, uh, and uh, indebtedness to, to those who came before us. So you said ancestry or heritage. Mm. Very good. I'm gonna, unless there is somebody else who would like to add something, I'm going to try to pull some strands from what you have all said and see if we can um, uh, come to some understanding. Um, so you have spoken about principles, values, right? Um, sometimes we refer to those principles and values as beliefs. Uh, I like to speak of, uh, of affirmations. What, what are the things that we stand for, that we affirm? Uh, so there's the element of then the belief system, the, uh, the, uh, that, thing, that which gives a kind of an ideological structure. And then you all spoke about the sense of, um, of tradition, of practices, of, uh, um, of things that give to the beliefs a kind of embodiment, right? beliefs standing by themselves, um, well, just float in the air. You have to bring them down and embody them in uh, practices. And then the strongest element that you all seem to be affirming is the sense of community, the sense of continuity, the sense, whether you want to call it of family or heritage or ancestry, all of this coming together creates uh, a, a sense of a of a community of belonging. And when I talk about a community of belonging, we're not just talking horizontally in time now, but that community of belonging is also experienced vertically through time. Community is not just a timely experience, it's a timeless experience. Um, Rabbi Mordecai Kaplan, to whom you will hear me uh, refer to on several occasions, uh, uh, spoke of Judaism as the evolving religious civilization of the Jewish people. The evolving, and some of you use that term, Judaism is not static. Judaism today is not what it was in the Bible. It is founded on that, but it has grown since that. It's like saying the United States today is not just what it was in 1776 or before. And the Constitution gives us a foundation, but there is much more that has happened since, uh, since the Constitution was approved in 1789 and, uh, and, and thereafter unfolding, right? So Judaism is evolving, changing. It is a religious value-centered, uh, but it is a civilization. It is connected to the life and to the experience of a people. And that people we know today as the Jewish people, although we have been known by different names throughout history, and we'll say a word about that. So 
if you take the, the elements of the evolving religious civilization experience, um, we can discern in Judaism three Bs, believing, behaving, and belonging. So all of those three constitute um, in their uniqueness and in their universality, the essence of what being a Jew is, believing, behaving, belonging. And that gives us not only the beingness of Jewishness, but the ongoing becomingness of Jewishness. So it's all about a be, to be, and uh, it's a constant process. It is grounded in an ancient tradition. You can be part of it by ancestral genealogy by birth, or you can choose it and join yourself to it. And in every generation, there have been people who have joined Judaism um, and sometimes even communities, groups as a whole who have done so. So Judaism is not just a uh, definition by birth, but it is a definition by choice. And in fact, I always tell uh, Jews by birth that we all have to be Jews by choice because we can be given something and be indifferent to it, or we can be given something and choose to learn it and to affirm it and to integrate it into our lives. So we're gonna be moving, kind of exploring what, what are those three elements the belief component, the community component, the behavioral component of Judaism uh, through rituals and practices. And um, that'll occupy us. The first three sessions will be primarily exploring some of the historic roots of Judaism and uh, how we come to be what we are today. And then we will look at some uh, beliefs and values and affirmations. And then we will talk about some practices and how they shape Jewish personal and communal life. Anything that I have left out that uh, you would care to make sure that, I, that we put into the, to the mix? Anything that is unclear of what I have said so far? Great. Well, we talked about um, the foundations of Judaism. Uh, where do we go back to? I mean, we just celebrated a Jewish New Year, right? What year are we in according to the, to the Jewish calendar? Anybody? 5782. 5782, <laughs> that is correct. And what does that designate? What does that year mark according uh, to Jewish tradition? Well, it is not the history of Judaism. That's more recent. According to the rabbinic understanding, and this is a concept that I'm going to be using from time to time, the rabbinic understanding. Um, for the past 2000 years, Judaism has been a religion shaped by the teachings of the ancient rabbis and their interpretation down the ages. So the people who uh, today are the religious communal leaders of Judaism are referred to as rabbis. There are no such entities, personalities in the Bible, right? The Bible is the foundation of Judaism, but there are rabbis in the Bible. We have priests. They offered sacrifices at the temple. They instructed the people. Uh, the rabbinic model or mode of leadership emerges in the early centuries before the common era, first century before the common era, and then flourishes after the destruction of the temple by the Romans. When there is no longer a temple where priests ministered and now synagogues begin to flourish. And the synagogues are the sequel to the temple in Jerusalem. And the new teachers, models, religious leaders are the rabbis. The word rabbi means teacher. So one way in which Judaism has changed over the past 2000 years is that we've gone from a biblical model to a post-biblical model, which has many different manifestations. If we go back to the Bible, which is our most ancient from last year to kind of round this out a little bit, 
if you go back to the Bible, uh, Jackie, is it possible to put up the um, the screen for the um, chronology of Jewish history? It's uh, by Michael Fishman, Biblical Period, Rabbinical Period, etc. Can you put that on screen for me? Give sure. Exactly give me just a couple of minutes, and I'll try and find that. And all of these uh, resources that I point to, you can go on our website and find and print out for yourselves. Uh, so we're going to look at a kind of a chronology of biblical history. I mean, a chronology of Jewish history. And the foundation document for that is what we call today the Bible. Interestingly, we started reading from the first chapter of the first book in the Bible yesterday at the synagogue as we started the reading of the Torah anew following the observance of Simchat Torah, which was the closing festival of the fall season, right? Rabbis and Kent. Just have a lot of work to do. And then comes the month of Heshvan, which we begin next week, no holidays or a whole month until we get to Hanukkah in, uh, in the middle of December. But uh, the screen that Jackie is going to put up for us shows us a kind of unfolding of the Jewish historical experience. And there it is. Here it comes. There you are. Can you all see that? There is a back page to that that we will not trouble ourselves with now, but that contains uh, the fourth period. It's uh, uh, the modern period. But you can go and access that. For the moment, I'd like us to look at the first two columns. When we say 5782, we are looking at a date that the rabbis believed was the beginning of creation. Not too long ago, six and before. Uh, astronomy and before sciences as we understand it today. But in the pre modern world, there was the belief that, you know, history kind of started not too long ago and that the whole world started not too long ago. So the rabbinic imagination, the early rabbinic imagination, was that the world began 57,000, I mean, 5,782 years ago, based on a kind of a chronology that tradition develops, taking us back to Adam and Eve. That is fictitious. That is, it, it, it is not historically documented. It is part of the legendary mythical tradition of Judaism. On the other hand, the Bible does provide us with very important historical resources to try to understand our origins. When does Judaism begin? Well, there is no starting point, and it wasn't known as Judaism to begin with, right? So if you kind of go back, we can begin to see the unfolding of what will become the Israelite tradition. The ancient Middle East was a place of great uh, migrations uh, from Mesopotamia, from uh, uh, other parts, nomadic settlements in, the, in, the, uh, in what is today known as Israel, the state of Israel. Biblically, it's referred to as Canaan, the land of Canaan. And how far back do we go there? Well, the Bible speaks about Abraham and Sarah, the kind of uh, genealogical and spiritual founders of the tradition. When could we date them? Well, we don't know. And, uh, you know, in a historical sense, uh, are Abraham and Sarah real persons or they represent more kind of models, founding models of the tradition. We're dealing with legendary material. However, the legendary stories about Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Rebecca and uh, Jacob and uh, Rachel and Leah and the descendants 
the, what become the 12 tribes, fit very well. The narrative fits very well into what we know about the history of the ancient Near East. And the two focal points of Jewish beginnings, of, and again, when I say Jewish, they weren't called Jewish in those days. We call it Jewish looking back, right? The, the focal point of our beginnings go back to the lands of Mesopotamia and Egypt. Abraham begins in Mesopotamia, the land of the two rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates, a rich ancient civilization of the Sumerians before them. And then he gets the call uh, in uh, chapter 12 of the book of Genesis, go from your birthplace to the land that I will show you. That ends up being Canaan uh, and Abraham journeys. And he goes there and the, and the enterprise is launched, right? So we, we emerge from Mesopotamia. Abraham lived in a, in a place called the city of Ur, U-R, or, and also Haran, H-A-R-A-N, in Mesopotamia. And he goes, he kind of leaves the big city and goes uh, to, um, to Canaan, a land less developed, so that he can develop his ideas. And there we have the stories of the patriarchs, Abraham and uh, Isaac and Jacob, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel and Leah. Uh, these stories occupy primarily the bulk of the book of Genesis, beginning at chapter 12. What about the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis? Well, that is about creation, about the Tower of Babel, about the flood and this material cannot be documented as historical. It is mythological. And the, the way that these stories are to told, beautifully told and literarily uh, magnificent, very much accords again with the stories of other ancient Near Eastern peoples, the biblical stories of creation. There's not one story, there are two stories, chapter one, chapter two and three uh, um, are very similar and at the same time, very different from, from stories of creation of other ancient peoples. But they set the foundation for a universal context out of which will emerge the story of Abraham and Sarah. There's a little interesting feature. I told you that they're not one, but two stories of creation in, in the Torah. So who can tell me, um, how was the human being created according to the biblical story? Any opinion there? How does the first human come into being? Well, um, I think that was curator from, I think it was this, uh, from from the soil. Okay, that's what Adama, I Adamo, Adama. Yeah, the word for human in Hebrew, Adam or Adam. Todd, you have a son by that name. Adam means human, but it really means earthling. It comes from the word for earth in Hebrew. So the soil, the human is the earthling. And according to a story in the Bible, Adam was created from the soil. And then where was Eve created from? From Adam's rib. The Hebrew word is selah. We don't really know that it means rib, but from some anatomical part of Adam comes chava, Eve, which means the mother of life. The word chava means in Hebrew, life. It's related to the word chayim, uh, means life. Hava Hayim. Well, that's one story, and you'll find that in chapters two and three. But if you look at Genesis number one, chapter number one, we have a very different story. We have a story of six days of creation. On the sixth day, after creating the physical universe, uh, God says, you know, I think we are missing something here. And God says, I will create the human. Male and female 
created God them. So the creation of a human kind in the first chapter of Genesis is men and women, male and female, created jointly. In fact, there is a rabbinic tradition that the first human was bisexual, male and female characteristics, because male, because it says male and female created God them. So the human is created simultaneously. But later, the story of the Garden of Eden in chapters two and three tells us a different story. There are other differences between the story of chapter one of Genesis and chapters two and three, which are the Garden of Eden. In one, God is referred to simply as Elohim, God, which is the more generic cosmic name of God. In Genesis two and three, God is referred to as Yahweh or yud Hey vav Hey Elohim. And today, when we come to that word, yud Hey vav Hey, we say Adonai. It's kind of a, a respectful reading of the word, which is the proper name of God. So one story is cosmic, the other is more particularly Israelite. In one, the humans are created just like other entities by the word of God. God said, let there be, let there be, and things happen, right? In the other story, God takes some earth, molds it, shapes it, creates a human, breathes into its nostrils to give it life, much more anthropomorphic story. So these are two different stories. They come from different periods, from different sources, and they have been juxtaposed together in the Bible, which shows us that the Bible is a very rich, textured text. It is not a book. It is a books. It is an anthology of books. And the first part of the Bible, which is called the Torah, consists of six bo of five books. And that's what we find in the ark and the synagogue. But there are more books than that to the whole biblical tradition. There are 24 books. And we use the word Bible to designate those 24 books. The word Bible means books, biblia. It's a Greek term. It's not even a Hebrew term. In Hebrew, we refer to that collection as Tanakh which is an acronym, the first initials of the three parts of the Bible, the Torah, the prophets, and the writings. But back to the chronology. Jewish history begins to take shape as history with the Exodus. And if you look at that column, the second category says 1250 to 1050. Exodus from Egyptian bondage, formation of a covenanted community, Covenanted means a bound community by responsibility and, and law. Conquest of the land of Israel and settle, of Canaan and settlement in Canaan. We begin to discern now strands of history as opposed to the legendary and mythical material of the book of Genesis. We're now in the book of Exodus, the second book in the Torah. And it is in the book of Exodus, chapter one, that for the first time the word am, people is used for our ancestors. But we are not Jews. We are Israel, the people of Israel, or the descendants of Israel. Remember, Jacob had his name changed to Israel when he struggled with the angel. Israel means one who struggles with God and moves on. But before, before we were known as Israelites, our founder, Abraham, he was not known as an Israelite. He was a Hebrew, Hebrew. And to this day, many congregations have the designation Hebrew as opposed to Jewish, okay? Many of the early reformed congregations refer, refer to themselves as so-and-so Hebrew congregation. We have one in town here. It was, it's a more ancestral term. Then we become the Israelites. And the term Israelite was used even in the United States a hundred years ago as a common designation for the Jews, the Israelite society of so-and-so, Israelite, as opposed to Israeli, which is the modern state of Israel, right? A national of the modern state of Israel is an Israeli, but an Israelite is the member of the people of Israel. Where does the term Jew come from? Who is the first person who has a name in the Bible that bears 
uh, a resemblance and gives us the origins of being called Jews. Judah. I'm hearing some talk in the background, but I don't know if it's addressing us. Oh, okay. So one of the sons of Jacob was Judah. He was one of 12 sons. And from the sons of Jacob come 12 tribes of Israel. Judah becomes the dominant tribe, especially after the destruction of the temple by the Romans. Uh, I'm sorry, after the destruction of the temple uh, by the Babylonians uh, in the sixth century, um, the people who lived in that territory of the tribe of Judah become known as the Judeans. And that designation continues from the Babylonians through the Greeks, through the Persians who ruled the land where the Judeans live and through the Roman period. In the Roman period, the Romans in the first century destroy the second temple, which had been rebuilt uh, by exiles who were allowed to return to the land of Israel by the Persians in the fifth century before the common era. And the Romans now destroy the temple and uh, the people who lived in that area are now dispersed in various directions, and they carry with them the name Judeans. That means members of the tribe of Judah. Their capital was Jerusalem. The temple was now destroyed. And from the Judean tribe, which was a uh, uh, tribal designation and a land designation, there emerges eventually the term Judaioi in the Greek and through Latin into modern languages, Judeans and Jews. So we are the Jews, the descendants of the tribe of Judah, although we carry with us, I'm sure, elements of the other tribes who didn't make it. So we have been known as Hebrews, we have been known as Israelites, we have been known as Jews, as Judeans, um, and uh, those are pr the primary three terms that are used to designate them. They're all of biblical origin, but they date to different periods. If you continue to look at the uh, chronology there, you will see how uh, biblical Judaism continues to unfold. Um, the people are expelled, they return, they rebuild the temple. Um, a very important component of biblical period Judaism is the influence of Greek culture and civilization beginning in the fourth century before the common era with the conquests of Alexander the Great who conquers much of the Middle East. And many of the Jews adopt Greek language, Greek customs, Greek practices. Um, in fact, much of the terminology that we use for religious language in Judaism comes from the Greek language. Example, I already told you about the term for the Bible, Biblia. It's a Greek term, means the books. How do we call the place where we come together for worship? What is Bethel Zedek? Synagogue. A, a synagogue. The word synagoga is a Greek term. It means a place of gathering, a place of assembly. The Hebrew word is the exact same meaning, Beit Knesset, a place of gathering. Um, and there's so much influence. Uh, the term that we use for the last morsel that we eat during the Passover Seder, afikoman, that is a Greek term. It means after dinner entertainment, afikoman. It's the last thing that you eat at the Seder. So Hebrew, uh, Jewish tradition is redolent with Greek terminology and significantly Greek patterns of thinking. In many ways, the early rabbis were kind of Jewish Greek philosophers. They were teachers of the Jewish people in patterns very significant to that of the ancient Greek Stoic philosopher and other expressions of philosophy. Some of the books in the Bible 
bear the influence of Greek thought. The book of Ecclesiastes, for example, uh, explores ideas that were very common among the Stoics and the Epicurean thinkers of um, Greek and Roman civilization. And uh, all you have to do is visit the land of Israel and see how Greek and Roman culture are present architecturally in the land of Israel. Romans inherit Greek culture and civilization, and then they apply it in a much forceful and mechanical way. So about half the history of what we identify as Judaism today has its roots in the Bible. The biblical experience is about hmm, 1800 years before the common era. We are now in the year 2021. So half of our history is biblical. If I were, I do this in class, when I'm, it, this, this is the span of Jewish history. See my arms begins here and we are here now. Well, the, what we can call the biblical period kind of takes us to my nose. Judaism begins in the biblical foundation, but then the rest of it goes from here in that direction. And that is the ongoing teaching, interpretation, application of the Jewish experience. And we will talk more about that next week when we talk about the rabbinic period and how it yields to the medieval period and then to modernity. Well, that's a very quick excursus of the biblical period. And uh, I invite you to look at these uh, outlines at your own uh, pace and discretion. Also uh, explore some of the books that are listed in the, um, in the website for your additional uh, reading pleasure. I want to finish with one more item, uh, Jackie, if you don't mind posting for us the um, sheet that has the different canons of scripture, the three columns, canons of scripture. Any questions as uh, that sheet goes up? Uh, there's a lot of stuff that I uh, kind of conversed about with you at this point. Uh, so, is there anything you care to clarify? So, right, right. Um, yeah. Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Sasso. So, so then, the th with the year, this being the year fifty seven eighty two, then is 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 year one the creation? That's the uh, ancient belief. Yes. Okay. Year one is creation. What is interesting about that is that, of course, we know scientifically that's um, a boba misa, right? That's a child's tale, sure, uh, sure, sure. but. What does begin about 6,000 years ago? Agriculture. Agricultural recorded civilization, writing, <laughs> the acknowledgement of history, the consciousness of history begins <laughs> about 6,000 years ago in the Middle East, among the Egyptians True. with hieroglyphs and among the Sumerians and Mesopotamians um, with um, uh, cuneiform writing. So awareness of history begins about 6,000 years ago. And that puts that year in very good company, 5782. Yeah, so uh, a people conscious of its unfolding is a matter of the last 600 years because of the invention of writing, which is really what sets history in motion, right? Okay, take a look at that sheet that uh, Jackie has posted for us. We talked about the Bible a lot. Everything that we kind of tried to identify was part of the biblical continuum. Um, the Bible, of course, even though it begins with the Jewish experience, is now also the inheritance of Christianity, which is a cultural and religious tradition that evolves from Judaism. 2000 years ago. Uh, and each of the primary traditions, the Roman Catholic and the Protestant, have pretty much the same books that we have in the Hebrew Bible. But in addition, Christianity adds what is called the New Testament. It is not listed here. 
and they have often a different arrangement of the books in the Hebrew Bible than what the Jewish arrangement is. Uh, we refer to these uh, arrangements as canons, C-A-N-O-N, -N, canons of scripture. Canon is what has been agreed by law and tradition to be something acceptable in a religious tradition. So much of Christianity has canon law, the law of the church, right? Well, the Jewish arrangement of the Bible, of the Bible is what you find in the third column as you look at it to the right. At the top of the page, it says Jewish Tanakh. We refer to this collection of books as the Tanakh, which is the initials for the three parts of the Bible. Torah, T, N is Nevi'im or prophets. K is Ketuvim or writings. You put the three parts together, T, N, K, you get Tanakh. It's a way of reading it in, as, a, as an acronym. And the Bible is divided into these three parts in the Jewish under tradition. The first part is the Torah, the five books that we find in the scroll inside of the ark, right? Um, this is a mini Torah. Okay? This is printed in paper and uh, something you can buy in gift shops and a nice little gift to give to B'nai Mitzvah. Uh, in order for a Torah to be in the ark, it has to be written in a special way by a scribe on parchment. It, it has to be used with a special quill, non-metallic ink, and so forth. But this is the contents of the Torah, five books. Look at the names of the books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Greek. They sound Greek, right? Well, yeah, the words are Greek because when the Bible was first translated from Hebrew into another language, that first language was Greek in the third century before the common era, third, fourth century. That Bible became known as the Septuagint because it was done by 70 uh, scholars. And um, Jews, many Jews in antiquity studied their Bible through the Greek, not through the Hebrew. And then this Greek translation becomes very important in Christianity that will follow Judaism. And then later, in Christianity in the third century, fourth century, a translation will be done into Latin, known as the Vulgate by St. Jerome. But the original is Hebrew. Hebrew, and there's some Aramaic in the Bible as well, but primarily Hebrew. And the first five books, which have Hebrew names as well, Genesis Bereshit, Exodus is Shmot, Leviticus is Vayikra, Numbers, the Midbar, Deuteronomy, Dvarim. Those are the five books of the Torah. That's what we keep in the ark in the synagogue. We take it out. It's considered the most sacred part of the Hebrew Bible. We read it in a yearly cycle, divided into weekly Torah portions with special readings for the holidays. Now, there's a second part to the Tanakh, to the Bible. It's called the Nevi'im, or the prophets. And those are the books that constitute it, beginning with Joshua, who is the successor of Moses. Moses dies at the end of the Torah. Joshua takes over and brings the Israelites into the promised land. And then we have some historic books and then begin what are proper the books of the major prophets. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, the 12, which is a collection of 12 prophets, which is one book in the Jewish tradition. Prophets were very unique type of people. While the priests emphasize the ritual duties, the sacrifices, the, the uh, practices, the prophets were interested in the moral behavior of the people. The word prophet is a Greek term. The Hebrew word is navi, prophetes, and navi does not mean one who foretells the future. It means one who foretells, one who speaks forth what they understood to be the will of God the moral will of God. And the prophets often castigated the people when they strayed from moral behavior. But they also had, they had a stern quality, but they also had a very forgiving quality. Because in the mindset of the prophet, God expects highly from Israel, but God is a loving and forgiving God. So the themes of love and discipline are very much at play in prophetic literature. 
And this is some of the greatest literature of all times. You wouldn't have Western literature without the writings of the prophets. They influence and shape English and Spanish and French world literature. There is nothing like reading Isaiah to understand the importance of responsibility and covenantal and moral behavior and, um, and the others as well. And there, the English language is riddled with, with quotes from these prophets that we don't even know they come, they come from there. They shall sit every person under their vine and under their fig tree and none shall make them afraid. Just, and it, so it, it's, it just shapes Western civilization. And then comes the Ketuvim, the third part, before we go to the Ketuvim. Every week, in addition to reading a section from the Torah, we read a passage from the prophets, and that is known as the Haftarah. The Haftarah or the Haftarah is a lesson from the prophets that complements the weekly Torah reading. Then comes the third part, the Ketuvim. And here we have a collection of different types of books that are more what is called wisdom literature. They're about teaching uh, daily, nearly secular uh, instruction, although some of it is, of course, religious poetry as well. The Book of Psalms, perhaps the most influential book of the Bible in Western civilization. Uh, 150 chapters of Psalms that have shaped our liturgy, our prayers and also the prayers and liturgy of Christianity. They're sacred in the Muslim tradition as well. They're known as the Zabur, and they're associated with King David. Then you have books of wisdom and teaching like Job. Job upends biblical teaching. According to the Bible, you do well, God will reward you. You do well, you prosper, you do bad, you are punished. Job says, wait a minute. There are a lot of good people who don't succeed and don't prosper. And there are a lot of bad people who seem to do pretty well. So Job challenges basic assumptions of much of, of biblical theology. And then we have beautiful so books like Song of Songs, poetry, the book of Esther, which we read during the holiday of Purim. Five of the books of the writings are known as Megilot, or short scrolls, Ruth, Song of Songs, Ecclesiastes, Lamentations and Esther, and they're read for different holidays. So the Bible or the Tanakh helps to shape our calendar, our life cycle, our rituals. And um, it's the kind of book that you need to read uh, as you move through the Jewish year. One way to do it is to do it through the cycle of Torah readings and then complement it with the prophets. And then as each holiday comes up, read the corresponding book that goes with that holiday. And this collection of books spans a period of about a thousand years. It wasn't written in one day. The decision as to how these books would become the Bible was made in the first century by the rabbis who succeeded the temple and the priests. And they agreed that this is our sacred literature, and this is what we will take with us into this new stage of Judaism when the temple no longer exists and the synagogue is emerging as the community. Jews are dispersed throughout the ancient world. Some Jews remain in the land of Israel, but not as a sovereign entity. Two new great powers begin to emerge, Christianity and Islam, and the Middle Ages in part, are the story of the conflict between Christianity and Islam and the Jewish people often caught in the middle. So that's a good place to end. Uh, I'll be glad to entertain any questions, uh, but this is a kind of a standing on one foot survey of the beginnings of the Jewish experience. Any questions or comments? We can go back to full screen and we will end very soon. Well, I have a quick question. Uh, what is the difference between Arab and Arabi? Because some people okay. call it Arab, some people call it Arabi. Right. Uh, a rabbi or Rabbi was the name for the teacher in the land of Israel. Arab 
was the name for the teacher in Babylonia. So the word rabbi or rabbi comes from the original designation of the teachers in the land of Israel. In Babylonia, they gave uh, a, a more limited ordination and they called it Rav. Today, both terms are used interchangeably. Rav uh, uh, kind of denotes more of a, a title of, of authority. People use the word Rebbe or Rabbi as a more of an endearing term. Although in origin, Rabbi was considered the higher term. In the, in the literature of the rabbis, you find this. Uh, greater than a Rav is a Rabbi. Greater than a rabbi is a rabban. Rabban is like the overall uh, title for a, for a great rabbi of a region and, and the whole generation. And, but then it says, and greater than all is simply the name. So when we refer to some of the greatest rabbis of antiquity, we simply say Hillel. We don't say Rabbi Hillel. First of all, the term rabbi didn't exist at that time. It evolves later. So the tradition honors the terms, but it recognizes that some of the earliest teachers who didn't have the title of rabbi or rav were the ones who really shaped the tradition. So rabbi and rav are acceptable terms uh, today. Rabbi is the anglicization of rabbi, rabbi. Any other questions or comments? Okay, well, uh, immerse yourselves in uh, the materials that are available. Do some reading about Jewish history. Uh, we will pick up a little bit on, uh, we will pick up with how Judaism evolves after the destruction of the temple and how the synagogue now becomes the foundation of Jewish life. We'll delve into the Middle Ages. We'll talk about a little bit of Jewish philosophy and mysticism, and then we will see how. Jews emerge into modernity, which is where we live now. What is it and, and how the difference, uh, the differences emerge between modernity and pre-modern Judaism? What is it that makes a modern Jew as opposed to say pre-1776, pre-1789? Those are the kind of a departure dates for modernity. 17 89, 1776, and if you know your history, you'll understand why those are departure dates. Wonderful, good to meet you all, and uh, you know, feel free to uh, explore whatever directions you want to go, and look forward to our conversation next week. Thanks for joining. And just a reminder that the recording can be found on our YouTube channel. And you can also find our other events on the Congregation Beth El Zedek website, www.bez613.org. We also have a YouTube, the YouTube channel, along with the YouTube channel, we have a Facebook, we have an Instagram, and we try our best to keep everyone connected to everything. So follow us and email us if you have any questions. And the resources for this class can be found again at our website, bez613.org under adult education materials. And that link is also in the chat box. And uh, special thanks to Jackie for helping us with all this uh, connectivity and uh, keeping us informed. Thank you. Okay, and as our name says, don't get stressed, be easy. Yes, bye, <laughs> have a good day. Be easy. Take care. I like that. I think you just coined a new marketing thing for me to work on. Okay, we'll work Maybe on that. Hoodies. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great week, everyone. Same to all of you. Bye bye.